China's missiles warn U.S. aircraft carriers to stay away China's latest volley of missile launches into the world's most hotly contested body of water served as a warning to two key U.S. targets, aircraft carriers and regional bases. The missiles launched into the South China Sea on Wednesday included the DF-21D and DF-26B, the South China Morning Post reported, citing a person close to the People's Liberation Army. Those weapons are central to China's strategy of deterring any military action off its eastern coast by threatening to destroy the major sources of U.S. power projection in the region. China is signaling to the U.S., its allies and partners that China has an answer to America's aircraft carrier strike groups, an answer that is always available and not dependent on deployment schedules, said Carl Schuster an adjunct faculty member of Hawaii Pacific University's Diplomacy and Military Science Program and a former operations director at U.S. Pacific Command's Joint Intelligence Center. In effect, China is saying, if the U.S. puts two carriers in the South China Sea, we send aircraft carrier killer missiles there. The launches show the U.S. the growing cost of any armed conflict, with a high-profile reminder of China's increasing arsenal of medium- and intermediate-range ballistic missiles. This is challenging American military superiority in Asia for the first time since World War II. President Xi Jinping rolled out the new PLA rocket force as part of a military parade in October, showcasing a capability that researchers at the University of Sydney warn could wipe out U.S. bases in the opening hours of a conflict. A U.S. defense official who asked not to be identified told Bloomberg News that China fired four medium-range ballistic missiles during a series of military exercises this week. They landed in the sea between China's southern Hainan Island and the disputed Paracel chain near Vietnam, the official said, not far from where U.S. carriers conducted drills in recent weeks to back up the Trump administration's decision to challenge Beijing's sovereignty claims. The Chinese Defense Ministry reiterated its contention that the exercises weren't directed at any one nation Thursday, without mentioning the missile launch. Still, ministry spokesman senior Colonel Wu Qian accused some U.S. politicians of trying to provoke a conflict between the two nations, telling a briefing in Beijing that China was not afraid. Within range The tests appeared intended for U.S. consumption, rather than a domestic audience with coverage on the country's heavily censored internet largely limited to foreign media reports. Earlier this week, China protested an American new two spy planes flight near the exercise zone in the East China Sea, presumably to glean intelligence about the country's capabilities. The aim is to test the capability of the troops, said Li Jie, a Beijing-based naval expert, who stopped short of confirming the missile test. You could say it is sending a warning to the U.S as the U.S. has increased its military activities in the South China Sea. While the two nuclear-armed powers have many incentives to avoid a clash, the risk of escalation is growing as the U.S. and its allies seek to push back against a more assertive Beijing. The U.S. has in recent weeks carried out a series of military exercises around the region and approved a landmark fighter jet sail to Taiwan. Against the backdrop of a national election President Donald Trump has attempted to focus on China. The U.S. Navy's recent exercises in the South China Sea have included joint operations by the USS Nimitz and USS Ronald Reagan carrier strike groups last month and separate drills by the Reagan this month. Those moves followed Secretary of State Michael Pompeo's July 13 announcement clarifying U.S. legal opposition to Chinese claims over most of a vital shipping lane, parts of which are also claimed by Brunei, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan, and Vietnam. China launched at least one other DF-26 missile in recent weeks, in what the Communist Party's Global Times newspaper characterized as a response to the U.S. carrier operations. The paper had earlier touted its carrier-killer missiles on Twitter, drawing a terse rebuttal from the U.S. Navy, which noted that the warships were nonetheless still there. Although China has yet to prove the ability to sink a moving warship, the cost of losing a $10 billion aircraft carrier the troops and hardware on board, and all the American military prestige they represent, would be immeasurable. That threat is causing Pentagon planners to consider less conspicuous ways of projecting force, with an internal Defense Department study recommending reducing the country's carrier fleet to 9 from 11 now, Defense News reported in April.
The PLA's missile arsenal is among the many factors driving the U.S.'s shifting security posture in Asia, with the Pentagon cycling nuclear-capable B-1 bombers to and from Guam, where they're more vulnerable to attack. Concern about the threat also contributed to the U.S.'s decision to withdraw from the Intermediate-Range Nuclear Forces Treaty with Russia and seek three-way arms talks with China. Even before this week's launches, China had quietly ramped up tests of ballistic missiles, in an apparent attempt to gauge their operational capabilities. The country fired off in excess of 100 ballistic missiles last year, more than three times North Korea's record tally, Kyodo News reported in February, citing people familiar with the matter. Locked and loaded China possesses what former Pacific commander Harry Harris has called the largest and most diverse missile force in the world, with scores of different weapons in development. The DF-21B can travel more than 1,500 kilometers, 900 miles, while the DF-26 can deliver warheads an estimated 4,000 kilometers, far enough to reach Guam. There are real questions about whether China's carrier killers actually work, said Ankit Panda a Stanton senior fellow with the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The latest tests may provide the U.S. a chance to better understand their performance. The People's Liberation Army Rocket Force has a busy testing schedule and this was likely operational training, Panda said. But certainly it'll be a reminder to folks in Washington that China's military continues to modernize and can deny access to the U.S. Navy in parts of the Asia-Pacific government working on giving shape to new air defense command by October, sources the defense ministry is likely to make an announcement in October on setting up of a new air defense command under the broad principle of convergence among the three services, people familiar with the development said on Thursday. The new air defense command will handle certain air assets like missiles of the Indian Army, they said. A high-level committee was appointed earlier this year to frame contours of the new Air Defense Command with a focus on ensuring jointness among the three services. The initiative was part of Chief of Defense Staff General Bipin Rawat's mandate to redesign all existing military commands to help them effectively deal with all future security challenges. It is learnt that the Air Defense Command is likely to be based in an area under the EAF's Delhi Headquartered Western Command or its Central Command Headquartered in Prayagraj in Uttar Pradesh. The Air Defense Command will bring all the air assets of the EAF, the Indian Navy and the Indian Army. In one of his first decisions, Chief of Defense Staff Gen Rawat in January issued directions to prepare a roadmap by June 30 to create the Air Defense Command to further enhance security of India's skies. The move was part of efforts to bringing in tri-services jointness and synergy include setting up of common logistics support pools in stations where two or more services have their presence. In the last few months, Gen Rawat has held a series of meetings with the EAF brass in giving shape to the Air Defense Command. Gen Rawat took charge as the country's first chief of defense staff on January 1 which was seen as a watershed moment for India's military planning to bring in convergence among the three services. The newly created Department of Military Affairs, DMA, under Gen Rawat is coordinating implementation of all the futuristic projects including redesigning of existing commands. The DMA is also working on a proposal to have a peninsula command which is likely to be formed by merging the Indian Navy's eastern and western commands. As per plan, the Tri-Services Command under a naval commander will have air assets as well as support of the Army, and it will take care of entire responsibility of maritime security challenge in the Indian Ocean region. Indo-Japan Mutual Logistics Pact can enable Navy's access to Djibouti and Andaman's The Acquisition and Cross-Servicing Agreement, ACSA, expected to be concluded at next month's annual summit between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Japanese counterpart Shinzo Abe would give the Indian Navy access to the Japanese military base in Djibouti and the Japanese Navy access to Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The AXA, commonly referred to as Mutual Logistics Services Pact, would permit the Indian Navy access to a Japanese base in Djibouti. The Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force, JSDF, would be permitted to use India's military installations in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, ET has reliably gathered. India currently has such pacts with the US, Australia, France and is likely to sign one with Russia later this year.
Delhi has since long been keen to get a presence in Djibouti as part of its Indian Ocean outreach. Djibouti, wedged between the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea, is a natural gatekeeper to a vital and extremely bustling sea lane. The base in Djibouti is the JSTF's first full-scale, long-term overseas base. Similarly, Andaman and Nicobar is critical for the Japanese Navy in the Bay of Bengal region. The AXA aims to expand Indo-Japanese strategic partnership amid an ambitious China whose aggression has unnerved many countries in Asia. Indo-Japanese defense ties have been growing over the past few years. At the end of the bilateral 2018 summit meeting in Tokyo attended by the two leaders, both countries had agreed to begin formal negotiations on AXA. The two leaders welcomed the joint exercise between each of the three services and the commencement of negotiations on the AXA, which will enhance the strategic depth of bilateral security and defense cooperation, according to the joint statement issued after the 2018 summit. The joint statement said, recognizing that enhanced exchanges in expanding maritime domain awareness, MDA, in the Indo-Pacific region contributes to regional peace and stability. They welcomed the signing of the implementing arrangement for deeper cooperation between the Indian Navy and the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. AXA will require the armed forces of India and Japan to help each other with logistic support, including food, water, billet, transport, petroleum, oils, lubricants, clothing, communications, medical services, base support, storage, use of facilities, training services, spare parts, repair and maintenance and airport and seaport services. The summit is being planned in the backdrop of the Japanese Defense White Paper 2020, JDWP, released on July 14, which had more criticism of China, than before. It is the first time that a JDWP has characterized China's actions around the Sinkoku Islands as relentlessly seeking to affect Japan's control over them at the time of the COVID crisis, widening the scope of Indo-Pacific partnership, including third country projects, are also on the cards, ET has learnt. Japan has decided to increase its investments in two of India's key neighbors Dash Bangladesh and Myanmar. Increase in Japanese FDI into India including Japanese companies planning to shift to India from China, and incentives for these business enterprises will be discussed by the two leaders at the summit, sources informed. Simultaneously, India and Japan will work to have technology companies build platforms that help emerging nations put government services online, taking ideas from Delhi's all-in-one digital infrastructure which allows access to various public services. Abe was scheduled to travel last December for the annual summit but had to postpone it due to protests in Guwahati. He had planned to visit Delhi in April which was postponed due to Covid. Ladakh face-off, India to order two more Israeli Falcon eyes in sky for $1 billion India is now finally going to seal the long pending around $1 billion deal to acquire two more Falcon airborne warning and control system, AWACS, aircraft from Israel which has been derailed at least a couple of times in the past due to the high costs involved. Sources on Wednesday said the acquisition of the two AWACS, with the Israeli Falcon early warning radar system mounted on Russian Aleutian 76 heavy lift aircraft, is all set to get the final nod from the Cabinet Committee on Security, CCS, after extensive interministerial consultations. The two new Falcon AWACS, which will add to the three such aircraft inducted by the AF in 2009 to 2011 under a $1.1 billion contract, will be delivered in three to four years. They will be more advanced than the first three Falcon AWACS with the latest upgrades, said a source. The need for additional AWACS, which are powerful eyes in the sky, was acutely felt during the pre-dawn strikes at Barlakot and the subsequent aerial skirmish with Pakistani fighters in February last year. The ongoing military confrontation with China in eastern Ladakh has further reinforced the operational requirement. AWACS or RU and C, Airborne Early Warning and Control, aircraft are critical in modern warfare because they can detect and track incoming fighters, cruise missiles and drones much before ground-based radars, direct friendly fighters during air combat with enemy jets, and keep tabs on enemy troop buildups and movement of warships. But Pakistan is ahead of India in this crucial arena, which struck home much to AF's disquiet during the aerial skirmish last year.
Pakistan has 8 to 10 Chinese Karakor Amigals at DK03 AWAX and Swedish Saab 2000 RU and C. China, in turn, has well over 30, including Kongjing 2000 Mainring, KJ200 Moth and KJ500 Aircraft. India currently has just 3 Falcon AWACS, with a 400km range and 360 degree coverage, and 2 indigenous Natra IU and C aircraft, with indigenous 240 degree coverage radars with a 250km range fitted on smaller Brazilian Embraer 145 jets. A much more ambitious indigenous AWACS India project worth 5,113 crore was approved by the Defence Ministry in March 2015 for 360 degree coverage with indigenous SR, active electronically scanned array, radars to be mounted onto Airbus A330 wide body jets. But this project will only now head to the CCs for clearance. The impending contract for the two new AWACS comes after the Defence Ministry decided earlier this month to also fast-track the 3,500 crore project cheetah to upgrade its Israeli Heron drones with laser-guided bombs, air-to-ground anti-tank missiles and other precision-guided munitions as well as advanced reconnaissance capabilities, as was reported by TOI. Israel is one of the top arms suppliers to the Indian Armed Forces. Indian acquisitions over the years range from Barak surface-to-air missile systems, Spider quick reaction anti-aircraft missiles and a wide array of drones and radars to Python and Derby air-to-air missiles, Crystal Maze and Spice 2000 precision-guided munitions.